Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the 15th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on September 18, 2022, are Amos chapter 8, verses 4 through 7, the alternate first reading, Jeremiah 8, 18 through 9, 1, Psalm 113. Our second reading is from 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 7, and Luke 16 is the gospel, verses 1 through 13. The parable of the dishonest manager, as it is called in my Bible. <laughs> well, you've talked, you've talked in times past, Caroline, about being suspicious of those titles and trying to figure out new titles mm. for parables as a way of kind of eliciting what people are noticing in a text. Mm -hmm. Anybody have a different title for this one? Oh, uh, <clears throat> hmm. that's a, uh, who is the master? Who is the master? Who is the master? Ah, okay. I think there's a, a play there. I think you've got multiple answers. Exactly. Exactly. And, and what we've done with these, uh, we've been handed down these titles because it's what once was central, uh, especially when parables were supposed to have one meaning, <laughs> which definitely failed. <laughs> one only. <laughs> only one. Yeah. And they couldn't agree on them, even giving us titles like this. Um, so I'm flipping it and saying, what if we paid more attention to the question that it raises? Mm -hmm. And in this particular, um, um, for my reading of it, uh, the last portion of the, of the text, which would be uh, the last part of the question in, in verse 13, which is um, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and wealth. And I'll, I'll say this again, um, but the passages throughout uh, this week, all talk about um, the persons or the the um, character of those who attend to practices of the privilege that result in pervasive poverty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, and and I'll have more to say about that as we get to the Old Testament readings. But uh, that I, if I were retitling it, I'd go there to leave it open ended. Uh, because I think that's the question it really raises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, I think maybe something along verse nine, like what friends will you make for yourself or who are your friends? You know, kind of along the lines of Jesus question and Luke of who is your neighbor? Mm -hmm. Uh or who is my neighbor? So who are your who are your friends? Because these friends that uh, that the dishonest manager make are not expected to return the favor. And so how I mean, along the lines of what you were saying, Joy, is what 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 kind who are your friends? And what does that what is that? And the way in which Jesus casts that whole idea of friendship in a different light particularly in uh, the Greco-Roman world. So that would maybe be my title. I don't know, something a little bit better than that, a little bit more pithy and better for a marquee sign. But, you know, but I like, like, who is your, who is my neighbor? Who are my friends? You could do, you know, since that's in Luke too. How about you, Matt? Well, I don't know. You, you both have stolen ideas that I had, or you, you got in, you got them in early. So it feels like they were stolen from me, but, but yeah, verse 13, I mean, is this added on? Is this part of the original parable? Who knows, you know, but what's clear is in this reading we've been given, it's the clearest part of the entire section. So don't neglect where it actually is quite clear. You cannot serve both mm -hmm. God and wealth, but I would say I have a hard time doing the parable of kind of a title. Mm -hmm. The closest I can get would be like the parable of the insurance policy or something like that, which is, um, you know, what are you looking to for your long-term insurance mm -hmm. here? And 
this is not a, a, a an attack on the insurance industry at all, right? But insurance is basically you're betting mm-hmm. for or against something catastrophic to happen <laughs> to mm-hmm. you or to a loved one, and and that's what happens to this person who is out is faced with the prospect of losing his job. Uh, one of my favorite lines in scripture. <laughs> I am not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. Mm-hmm. I totally get that. Mm-hmm. Friend. Um, and so he's got to figure out what, what are the rules I can play by? What are the, what are the bets I can place to provide me long-term security? And he knows exactly what will do that. And that's defrauding his master and helping out these others. And, mm-hmm. and everybody around him seems to pat him on the back and say, great job. Even the guy he defrauded. Mm-hmm. You get it. You know how the system works and you either play the system or the system plays you. And mm-hmm. so he does that. And then, so the response then at the end where Jesus says, you know, those people are smarter than you all because <laughs> they know how the game works. Like, they aren't naive about the power of money. They aren't naive about the power of power and influence. They know where security comes from and how you guarantee it for yourself. Um, why aren't you smarter? Seems to be what Jesus is saying to his followers, right? Why do you think you can play games with wealth and power and not have it corrupt you? Why do you, you know, so if you really want to be welcome to the eternal homes, where are you going to find security? So that's kind of where I would go. I don't know if that has anything to do with an insurance policy, but you know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's my way in. How about that? So it's less about the ethics of this manager, but it's more about, he knows the game. He knows how the game's played. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the game's real. It's a religion, according to verse 13, or at Mm -hmm. least it involves power that's bigger than you as an individual. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. It's a tough parable. Mm -hmm. It's probably not meant to be explained. I don't know if any of the parables are as much as to be experienced in terms of where's the scandal here. Mm -hmm. And it's all over. It's writ through. Mm-hmm. And then to take a step back and say, where's the scandal in our system? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's also writ through. And so where, right. how does anybody escape from that? Right. Which is maybe where verse 13 sends out a lifeline. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now I'm preaching. Now you found the preaching? <laughs> not that I would ever do that. I always say we do not provide <laughs> sermons here on Sermon Brainwave, only ideas. That's right. That's right. right. We all, all three of us preach, so we have a hard time stopping with this idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, um, I, I did some searching while while you guys were were talking for uh, the title of a book. Um, Grace a Matthew, a Matthew um, wrote a book called Words of Fire, Spirit of Grace. Um, years ago, and I wanted to to get the exact title of it because in it. Um, when she talks about Luke 15, the text that wasn't read last week, the, it's actually what we call the parable of, of, the, uh, of the lost son, um, uh, she has a, a little poem in there where she talks about how the, the parables really don't have t- titles and shouldn't have titles. And uh, in her little poem, she says, that I will never give it a title. And uh, so if someone uh, is caught by uh, our introduction about uh, what title we would give it, uh, I would invite them to look up uh, that book, Words of Fire, Spirit of Grace, uh, by Grace of Matthew, and get that poem in relationship to Luke 15. Um, If you don't use it this week, you might use it another time because it's a wonderful thing uh, about parables and about focusing um, uh, putting too much narrow focus on it. Mm-hmm. And we should point out too, we're going to have a parable, I won't name it, uh, about the power of wealth next week mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the destructive and God's disposition toward poverty or toward those who are who suffer from poverty. And so mm-hmm. we've got that. That said, Amos 8 is a tough text in any setting. Yeah. <laughs> tough to connect to Luke 16 exactly, maybe, unless it's about the game. But I don't know, you, Joy, you said you've got uh, the, the, yeah, the pulling together in terms of these practices of the privilege that reser- re- result in uh, pervasive poverty. poverty. Um, so, you know, playing the game, as you wonderfully described, uh, looking at the uh, uh, Lucan parable, um, 
in our system, playing the game, playing it well, playing it so that you can be praised by your quote unquote friends, Caroline, um, um, results in um, um, displacing so many people. And uh, uh, Amos actually identifies that. Hear this, you that trample on the needy mm -hmm. yeah. and bring to ruin the poor of the land. And that last verse, uh, the, Lord, the Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, I will not forget any of their deeds. So uh, I'm not sure I want to want to uh, preach on this because it's a heavy text, as mm -hmm. as is the Jeremiah text. Um, uh, but I, I do think it's a challenge to us that can be woven into um, either the uh, verse 13 of, of the Luke uh, passage or uh, what you just described in the whole of uh, that parable. Um, just what does it mean that our commonplace practices trample on the poor? Yeah. Um, and that yeah, yeah I, I think that's a, that's an important connection, Joy, and particularly verse four here, this you that trample on the needy and bring ruin to the poor of the land. And the, the way in which way in which those practices or the way in which our loyalties then have ramifications for uh, for those around us. And so that like back to back to chapter 16, you cannot serve God and mammon or God and wealth, right? So the verb there is uh, is to be enslaved to. Uh, and the only other time the verb is used in Luke is in the parable of the prodigal son, uh, where, listen, for all these years, I've been working like a slave for you. And I have never disobeyed your command. And so that's a really, that's a, uh, that's a really intense verb. Uh, this is, this is different than uh, diakonia. This is, this is a, a recognizing that, uh, that, mm, how do I want to put it? Um, it's not even loyalty. It's a kind of, it's a, requirement yeah that is that is this is this is this how you're going to be is this how you're going to have your you're going to be yoked to and the way in which then that 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 choice between god and and the practices or god and wealth what what does that lead to that that we that we sit back and think about what do those what do those loyalties or what do those what do those enslavements bring about? Mm -hmm. uh, there's consequences mm -hmm. for that, and that's why I think what Amos brings out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, and and it's I'm trying to think of the word that you're that you also were thinking of. It's more than an obligation. It's it, it, it's, it's, it's bondage well there you go that's a go yeah it is and belonging bondage. well it's and and there's a almost like a cast right you know your place in this system yeah, yeah. So you're never going to break out of poverty if you're in there but but even here in amos it's the perpetrators who are all like we're going to start working at sunup or at sundown as soon as the sundown. sabbath ends you know and we're gonna we're gonna mess with the economy we're gonna mess with currency we're gonna mess with scales i mean it's yeah, because if they don't, their competitors will. You know what I mean? I, I know this is not written in a capitalist society, but you think about how competition is written into that, right? If we're not open twenty four hours a day, our competitors will. They're, you know, and and I am not an economist, and I don't want you to take my words into the pulpit, <laughs> pretending that I am. But you know what I mean? But it's just kind of knowing the place mm -hmm. that everybody is, and the pressures on everybody to conform to. Mm -hmm. And, Even without and, making a conscious decision of conforming. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the way in which your bondage, <laughs> the way in which your bondage, uh, either unbeknownst to you or that you choose to ignore, bondages others. Exactly. Uh, or you re-bondage others. And so I think that that it would be a really intense sermon but uh, but it, we might be there right now in terms of 
being able to help people name uh, what, uh, this is not just whom you serve. <laughs> this is, this is, so that will help me, thanks for helping me figure out what the word I wanted to use. Which I realize all, all of those words are very loaded words. I mean, even the, you know, the, the, the fact that the NRSV, for example, chooses to, uh, chooses to translate that you cannot serve. Well, it's no, it's cannot, you cannot be enslaved to. And so, uh, but maybe we take that on as well. What does that mean? You know, um, so. In, it, it, one, it attends to the fact that um, the word of God is a living word, that it speaks to our capitalistic culture, even though it wasn't written in a capitalistic culture. And it critiques our culture just as it critiqued that one. And, and that's why speaking these words, you know, uh, of Amos and, and if we move into Jeremiah becomes just as difficult to communicate what the results of our actions are, what the uh, consequences of who we commit ourselves to. If we commit ourselves to the kingdom of God, to the things of God, to um, the uh, equity and justice of God, the ramifications for those beyond our inner circle will be peace, will be um, mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. If we um, bond ourselves to uh, the things that are not of God, the ramifications for others will be what is described here as trampling on the needy and yep. bringing ruin to the poor. I, I think I may have mi mixed that quote up. Um, but if you let me go to Jeremiah, um, you can stop me. That's my I just say one quick thing is- Yeah, there you are. That's why I said that. <laughs> one thing in the back of my head as we're talking about this is it's probably easier to preach about all of this in terms of big abstractions. Everybody go home saying like, you're right, the world's a terrible place. You know, we're in this captivity to all of these things we can't control. But there's got to be a place where it comes down mm -hmm. and you think of what's one thing we can do. What's one tangible way this community can stand as a sign of, of acknowledgement of that and confession of that, but also resistance to it. You know what I mean? I think it's, mm -hmm. um, well, I, I don't know the answer to that. That probably depends on each congregation. But I think I, that's a very good point. I was thinking, I was thinking the exact same thing of uh, of a, a context in which I find myself in terms of how uh, a decision is made that that clearly that that clearly lodges enslavement toward something that is not God. Mm -hmm. And so that's to name that specificity. So it doesn't become, doesn't become a generalization, I think. And I, and I think it, to what extent the, the preacher has to be able to name that in, in their own context. So that's an important thing. Yeah. And giving you guys that entry uh, just sets up my comments perfectly once again. I love how we do that. Uh, in, in, as I look at uh, this, this particular portion of Jeremiah, which is uh, the perfect example of why Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet, you know, uh, and um, uh, it's, um, he sees poverty and the perversion of justice, and he's distressed. Um, not unlike Mother Teresa, who uh, we, we found out after her death that she actually was really depressed. And people who thought, you know, she was, you know, so faithful, how could she be depressed? Well, if you can, if you aren't depressed when you look at the brokenness of this world, those who have been abandoned, trampled, forgotten, those whom our laws actually make it impossible for them to thrive. Um, if, if that doesn't distress you, I'm just, I'm really curious to the question of who is your neighbor and who, who is the community that you actually care about. And, and so these words of Jeremiah uh, behoove us, I think, to find that specificity that uh, the two of you are asking us to do in our sermons. Um, what is it that causes that grief that makes our hearts sick? And to name it, 
to say that what, why we are in this um, moment is because God is not present, because God is not central, because God is not served. And how is it that we acknowledge whoever that master is, we acknowledge um, wh whoever our friends are, I'm trying to think of all the things that we've already said, um, uh, that we acknowledge who it is that is trampled, name it for our community, for our congregation, um, and maybe not, maybe it is bigger. Maybe we do name it for our politicians and for our nation right now, or in my own denomination, to name it for our church, uh, large, larger denomination, not just our congregation. Because the reason that people's lives are destroyed is because these systems are not being attentive to what offers life, what offers, uh, what, uh, what shares love, what, what, what brings hope. And, and I'm distressed about that right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank you, Jeremiah. <laughs> well, and it, uh, yeah, and to give, I think the church needs to be a place where we're giving space for that lament. And how is it that we express those fountains of tears and weep day and night? And where can we do that? And then maybe this is where I bring in the psalm as uh, as not not to erase those feelings, but that where is that balm? That balm is is that the Lord who who raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap and. And then that also goes back to, well, who, who is it that you will be enslaved to? Wealth or this our God? Like, how, how is the, what's the choice there? What's the choice? And, and when you see where, and that's, of course, what the prophets did, right? The prophets look at the situation you know, they're historical books. They look at the situation. They're not necessarily predictors, but they say to Israel, you keep doing this. You keep going in this direction. This is where it's going to end up. And then to what extent that's what a preacher needs to say. We keep going in this direction. We keep doing, this is the consequence of what, of what we've laid out, of what we've decided to be enslaved to. Uh, that's what the consequence you want. Then <laughs> that's the consequence you're going to get. Verse 20 in, in Jeremiah, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. We keep, are we dizzy? It's because we refuse to stop running in circles. And, and you're absolutely right. That is our task. Our task is to name that. And so then the hope becomes, what is the choice? The choice is to keep these systems in place that are destroying or to choose God, who, um, how, how does it say it in the, uh, the, uh, the psalm here? From the rising of the sun to the setting, the name of the Lord is praised. Why? Because this God is faithful. That could be a good title too, Choose God. Oh! <laughs> oh. I don't wanna, I don't, I'm not trying to pour any cold water on this, but I do want to say that I, I would want the preacher as well to say, like when you said, what's the choice, Caroline? Part of it is the choice is God appears to be really slow to act. <laughs> uh, the choice is the guy in the parable in Luke 16 figures out a solution pretty quickly that works really well for him. Uh, Jeremiah is going to be incarcerated next weekend, <laughs> right? How, where's this going to get Jeremiah? He's going to get himself in trouble with it. I mean, just to kind of point out that that these are battles that are always needing to be fought and refought. These yep. are exhausting, slow battles. You know what I mean? So yep. again, not trying to pour cold water, but just to kind of name as well the exhaustion that so many people feel and to name this as a way, ooh, I'm going to get kind of Lutheran here, as a way of the cross, right? As a way of, yeah. of, of sacrifice as well. And the way of the way of Luke, the way of Luke's Jesus. Mm -hmm. We have we always have to go back to Luke 4. 
The spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring sight to the blind, let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then they want to throw him off a cliff. Exactly. So when you set and you set your face to Jerusalem, when you set your face to Jerusalem, you know, it's going to be there. Uh, And so you don't, you even, you don't even need to be Lutheran to say that you can just read Luke. (laughs) It rubs off on me here in this office, but anyway, I'm sure first Timothy two will fix all of this. If I give one, if I give one line on on First Timothy, uh, uh, Caroline, in in this recognition of you know when we set our our, our sights, the result is going to be, um, uh, what is your word? Maybe Matt delayed. Uh, that that we're going to be delayed and we're going to be confronted, and um, so uh, this question of the work of the witness, the work of the prophet, uh, and in this case, uh, the the work of uh, Paul, I've been appointed a herald and an apostle, apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. The context of the witness, that's, that's Paul's context. The context is always wherever they are, and to whomever they have been given, uh, their voice has been given volume, is to proclaim the work of Christ, the work of God, to reconcile humanity, which for this text, and maybe for all of the texts this week, is to proclaim the work of Christ, to reconcile humanity to a God we no longer believe exists. You ask uh, of the question of the choice between do we serve the systems of wealth or do we serve God? In some sense, this whole idea of naming God as the one made known in Jesus is to remind the people that gather each week that we gather together to remember that Jesus reveals to us the creator God who is faithful to care for the least of these. Yeah, it's right up there like what, what the psalm says, that the, the agency here for change is God, and it's not us and our effort. Um, I see one thing that bothers me about this text, though, is, you know, it starts off so nicely about supplications, prayers, intercessions for everyone, for kings, all in high positions, pray for your leaders. But then the, the second half of that is so that we might live a quiet life, <laughs> a peaceful life. I mean, this is one of there are many reasons that the, the Timothy literature might might rub you the wrong way. And this is also one of them that it, it seems to be settling for. Um, in terms of the, the book's view of what the church looks like in the world, it seems to be setting for settling for respectability and kind of mm. comfort within the culture at times. Now, the part that you quoted pushes out of that, certainly, but I just well, want to name that yeah, too. That, the, well, if the goal is quiet and peaceable living. Well, sure. and that's what it's that's what it's going to go into. I mean, it, that if you if you keep on reading uh, through through chapter two, verse fifteen, it's it's about correct yeah. worship, and then uh, that's when we get the verses that I mentioned last week, and then verse chapter three, verses one through thirteen, qualifications of worship leaders, and so clearly that's that's. Oh. An issue, a broader issue. Uh, I, I, I know that. Yet last week I put a huge kibosh on First Timothy <laughs> and Second Timothy, and and I'm sure that there are people out there going, "Well, that was not helpful." I still, what do I do with that? But this is part of preaching. Uh, part of preaching is to uh, to take on passages that have become a life of their own in our culture. Uh, over the centuries and not not to dislodge or to remove necessarily the Timothy <laughs> the Timothy literature from the New Testament, although there could be a few things. Luther wanted to get rid of James and Revelation, as we know, and I'm sure there are plenty of books that we all want, would rather not have there. Uh, but it is to, it is to say, is there, is there a redeemable word here? Uh, but also to give people the kind of, uh, the, the kind of agency and the kind of power to read scripture with, uh, with, with a kind of faithfulness and a kind of responsibility and a kind of 
ethic that is connected to the God whom they have chosen. Mm. And uh, sometimes our scripture does not follow that. If, if I can slip in, um, Matt, uh, this idea of um, respectability, I, I, I want to I wanna agree with you on this and challenge our listeners to hear your challenge for that, but also to read this maybe not as a call for respectability, but in the midst of all of the strife and division, that our current culture is in, to see the possibility of living together without strife as maybe a, a offering of hope that some of us who have been fighting for a long time have are actually fighting for. We're not fighting because we wanna fight. We're fighting because we want peace. And, and so I, 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 I totally appreciate um, not making this easy, uh, which I think is what you're challenging us for, um, and but but instead to 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 allow us to ask for that hope um, that someday the divisions, some days the the caste systems that separate us, uh, some days all of the things that cause us to want to throw books out or or eliminate parables. Um, someday that will not be the case because we will have found a way to be a community where all belong. I need that, that hope, especially in times of division. <laughs>